are really incredible animals. They play key roles in numerous ecosystems around the world. In all these ecosystems, bats are critically important in pollination and seed dispersal. And the world would be buried in insects if it weren't for bats to keep them in check. But there's never been a time in history when bats need help more. Because white nose syndrome thus far has been one of the most devastating afflictions to hit American wildlife. It's killed off millions of bats in the Northeast. It's moved south and west. And this is a time of extreme stress for bats. But we now know that even the hardest hit species are surviving as small fragments of the original populations. And those populations, we hope, will be resistant to WNS. White nose syndrome hit the state of Vermont in 2008. And at that point, we really did not know at all what we were facing. By walking up to these caves and seeing these bats flying out of these caves and mines here in Vermont in the middle of January, where the temperatures are far below freezing. Those bats were not gonna make it. They were dying right before our very own eyes, and we didn't know why. Well, today we're going to enter the target cave for the research associated with survival from year to year of the bats that hibernate here. And we'll weigh them, determine their species and sex, we'll look for the fungus, and we're going to ban them with a ban that is specific to this year. And the idea is that these target research sites will be going to year after year and seeing what we're getting for band return. And that will tell us that they are some survivors that we need to pay particular attention to. One of the positive things that we're seeing right now is that we're going into these infected caves and mines and the bats are actually behaving normal. These bats looked healthy and that means that there were some survivors. And these animals have been exposed to white nose syndrome for several years in a row, and that's a good sign. And maybe that's related to their ability to survive white nose syndrome. So the Fish and Wildlife Service is here with Scott Darling and his team because we are scrambling to try to come up with some management actions that we can take to slow the spread and hopefully uh, recover the bat populations. And we're here to do what we're calling a survivor study. We're looking at the, the remnant populations of little brown bats that we still find in the northeastern U.S. And we're hoping that, that what we're seeing here are the, the seed of a population that will ultimately restore the populations of little brown bats to a viable status. Prior to white nose syndrome's arrival, bats like the little brown bat were extremely common, so common in fact that they didn't warrant counting. The unfortunate reality is that right now we are facing potential extinction of species from this disease. The Fish and Wildlife Service is reviewing the little brown bat, the northern long-eared bat, and the eastern small-footed bat for potential federal listing under the Endangered Species Act. And there are other species that are affected like the tricolor bat that, that are showing signs that, that they could be in, in jeopardy of, uh, of extinction. Today's visit was a good one. We handled about 76 bats. The fact that we were seeing bats, healthy looking bats, uh, good weights, not a lot of fungal growth, uh, was, it was a good thing, certainly. We have some examples of survival. We've seen it at this site and, and several others, but really figuring out what that means at a population scale is the critical thing. Nothing is off the table at this point. We're really looking at all angles. We have a national plan in place that uh, has a broad partnership across state, federal, and tribal agencies. We're now rolling out the implementation portion of that plan, and that really lays the, the groundwork for the entire coordinated response. Because as long as there are bats out here, as long as they're continuing to be affected by this disease, we're going to keep looking for an answer. The focus of our work at USGS with white nose syndrome is to both understand the physiology of the pathogen that causes this disease and to develop practical diagnostic tools to facilitate diagnosis of the disease and evaluation of management. When we grow cultures, we put a piece of bat wing on a petri plate and that growth medium elicits the growth of numerous fungi off of that piece of skin. There's something on the middle of that piece of skin that looks like a colony of white nose syndrome fungus growing. And once we have it at this stage in the process, we can then transfer it to additional plates 
to generate larger amounts of biomass that we can use to study. Fungi can be very challenging pathogens because they reproduce by producing environmentally resistant spores. And so if you have an outbreak of white nose syndrome in a cave. No sign of lesions, no, uh oh, fungus on the nose right there. Now I have it in Illinois. It's very possible that the fungi that are killing the bats are leaving behind literally billions upon billions of these spores. And so the fungus can persist long term in the environment. And so therefore, I think as humans, our number one responsibility is that we modify our activities so that we don't inadvertently transmit the fungus around the world. And so that means when we do go into that site that harbors spores of the fungus, it's important that we take basic universal precautions so that we don't transmit it on our coveralls that we might wear and inadvertently make the problem worse. Mammoth Cave has major bat roosts and we have something on the order of 400,000 people come and visit Mammoth Cave every year. And now that Mammoth Cave is among the sites that are white nose positive, we were worried about the potential for us to have visitors that can transport white nose syndrome spores to other places. So we've been very proactive in limiting the spread as much as possible as we can by simply having our visitors walking over about 16 feet of carpet and then walking over a mat with a solution to increase the cleaning of the shoes that helps remove the spores because we don't want our visitors to be the ones who take White Nose to Wind Cave or Jewel Cave in South Dakota to wherever they're going home to. And I think the biosecurity good, mats that we're using are probably one of the more effective means for dealing with walking tours of large numbers of people. I think there's a role for people in protecting bats. White nose syndrome is one piece of it, but bats need a lot of friends. So even if people can't do anything to cure white nose syndrome, the bats that survive are going to need good, healthy habitat, and we need to be doing a better job protecting our cave bat roosts because bats are an important part of this ecosystem in maintaining it like we see today. The Forest Service is interested in white nose syndrome because healthy forests need healthy bats and vice versa. And there are a lot of things that people can do to help bats. And one of the first things you can do to help bats is to provide bats with shelter, like a barn or whatever structure they can use to raise their young in the summer. And also bats like to live in both live and dead trees. So you just wanna keep as many trees up on your property as possible. You can also create a home for them by building a bat house. For bat houses, placement is, is very important. And so bats like it to be nice and warm. So it's really about the placement and how it's going to control the microclimate that's within that bat house. One of the great things to come out of white nose syndrome is that we've now suddenly recognized that bat populations need monitoring just as we've done for many decades for birds. And there are opportunities where the public can get involved in helping go out with bat detectors to monitor the status trends of bats. We're at Yellowstone Lake State Park in Wisconsin and we're here to do some citizen science bat monitoring and like many of the state parks in Wisconsin, this park provides a lot of great habitat for bat species that we're particularly interested in such as the little brown bat which is one of the bats greatly affected by white nose syndrome. And there's several bat houses here with 4,000 bats. When the bats come out at night to feast upon the very abundant insects that are here today, we'll be there with our bat detectors to record them and uh, see what species we have and uh, do an emergence count and watch the bats as they leave their roosts and count them. Every year I get more and more people coming to these events with interest in bats. They hear about white nose syndrome and they want to help to preserve and protect the bats that we have. Acoustic monitoring is where we take a device that allows us to take an ultrasonic bat call and brings it to a level that we can hear, like little clicks and chirps of bats. And we use that information to get a relative idea of bat populations. 
And the data that we are collecting is important because in the unfortunate case we were to get white nose syndrome in Wisconsin, we'll be able to look back at our historic records and see where species were occurring. And if there were efforts to bring a species back, we'd be able to see where those species originally occurred. With all the bad that white nose syndrome has brought to the bats, one good thing that's come out of white nose syndrome is the increasing awareness of the public about bats and how important they are. For example, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources hosted a Wisconsin Bat Festival. Multiple agencies were involved in helping the public see what we do as far as research and what bats we have in the state. We even had bats from other countries there in a live bat display to get people up close with these bats to see that they're not the, the scary creatures that we all think that they are. And that the cooperation from the public is the perfect partnership to protect the bats and prepare ourselves in the unfortunate case if white nose syndrome does come into our state. Wisconsin is the last stronghold of little brown bats, 20 feet below us right now. 143,000 bats live here at Needham Mine. We haven't found white nose syndrome in Wisconsin yet, but we certainly have uh, white nose prevention plans in place for every site that we have in the state. We sent postcards to all of the, the landowners within a two mile radius of our three largest hibernation sites, and mainly in the hopes of just allowing people the opportunity that if they do see bats on the landscape during the middle of winter, to contact us directly because the earlier we know, the, the better management actions we might be able to take. To be honest, I just, you know, I have to remain optimistic that every year we're going to go in there and not find it, um, but with White Nose being as close as it is, um, there's certainly a good chance that we might find it within the next five years. There you, go. you know, anyone who works on bats for a while realizes how fascinating you are and how adaptable they've been for the eons that they've been on the earth. And they are a tough animal, and if we could help figure out what it is that might keep them around, they'll respond. It'll take time, but they'll respond. They are adaptable, and they just depend on us right now, and we're here. We're not in the business of throwing in the towel, and we know it's too important. We know that we're the ones that are needed to do this, and we're gonna keep plugging away at it, but we're not gonna quit.